We're live. Woo! Hello, everybody out there. I can't, can I see their names on this or do they just come in anonymously? They just come in anonymously. So yeah, generally it takes people a while to filter in. Sure. Yeah. So I'll, I'll wait to introduce you until, Rhoda, you have any way of quantifying? Well, go wait for a minute. Welcome to the gathering room. I can't see your texts today <laughs> um, because we have a special treat, but uh, I'm very, very excited. You're, oh, somebody, Jill is here. from New Mexico. We, okay. I love I'm New Mexico. Kidding. I've never seen your face. Um, oh, whoa, Toronto. Brenda. Brenda. This is just getting better. <laughs> John, beautiful. So good to see you. Must be in a similar time zone because we're in the, Bail. there's Vail. There's Tracy. Yay! Oakland. Hi. Oh, I miss Oakland. I love seeing people's the, the little circles are bigger. Hi. South Africa. Yeah. Magic. Usually it's little Facebook things and they're just tiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can't see them. But today everybody's showing up big and beautiful and um vibrant. And I love you all very much. So I'm going to jump in right now because we have a special guest. You know, I do that very occasionally. And this is this woman is very special indeed. Her name is Linda Sievertson, and she is a book midwife. She has brought many, many books into the world, including her most recent book, Aww. which is The Beautiful Writers. And um, it's... And it's a very interesting book on how to write a book because it's not only Linda's story, which we'll get into in a minute here, but it's dozens, like maybe even how many? 60. 60 like 62 of you. Who are, how would you define the, are they all writers or? Are some all, all best selling authors. Yeah. Yeah. 60 best selling authors quoted yeah. here. Legends um, like yourself. <laughs> my idols. I'm a legend in my own mind. Um, yeah, so it's the combined wisdom of a bunch of successful authors with Linda's um, very, very informed take from having midwifed so many books. So I just want to, can I just ask you questions? Oh, please, okay. please, please. So you say in the beginning, at the beginning of the book that you always wanted to be a writer. Yeah. My question, this is me getting all life coachy on you, right? Go for it. Why? So I remember my earliest memories are being a little girl in our den library growing up. And my sister was obsessed with school. I was not. I thought, well, I should just study the fun stuff. So I would go into my parents' den library and read about astrology and the lost city of Atlantis and mm. um, the Renaissance painters and Guggenheim's printing press and like cheese logs from Bon Appetit magazine. And I was in heaven. And I, I don't know. I just always, I always knew, always knew, so, but I didn't feel smart enough growing up. So that uh, was tricky. That's very overrated. So was it, was it the, that you just wanted to add to the catalogs of adventures or was it you wanted to be in the pages? I've met writers who want to just, they identify with the people in the pages yeah. and then other people who want to be in the world of right of yeah. like people who create in, explorers and creative writers, which are you? Um, I think I'm a creative writer. And I remember thinking as a kid that there was nothing better you could do with your life, not even being president of the United States or a movie star. <laughs> so did you have, I always talk to clients about an ideal day where you imagine several years or decades ahead yeah. and you picture the day you will have on, on an ordinary day in your ideal life. Mm -hmm. I wonder if, as because you're really, really good at uh, goal setting and imagination. I want to talk more about that later. Yeah. But like, what was the image you had of your life as a successful author? And does it match what you've now come to live? Great question. My father's best friend, so my uncle Chuck, was a New York Times bestselling author. He had sold 6 million copies of a book, a book called The Second Son. Huh. That that Stallone and and Redford and Newman and everybody wanted to make. It was like MGM bidding wars the whole bit. Wow! And um, so he would come to town. We lived in San, near San Francisco, and he was in LA. 
And he would come to town in his limo on book tours and take me and my sister with him. Mm. And we would be waiting in the limo while he'd run up and do some press and then come back. And I remember thinking, holy, sh this is like it. This is what I want. And then I had a weird goal to help save forests. And I thought, well, the only way to help heal the world is to have a big enough sort of megaphone. Mm -hmm. And I saw that he had it. And that's what I wanted. Fabulous. So does the, what does your life now match what you expected when you were watching him? Yes and no. So he went through, um, he was a little bit of a wild partier kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And I was like a super devoted, almost like religiously devoted wife. So mm -hmm. to me, it was all about like being wife and mother during the day and writing all night and not sleeping for decades. So as uh, you and I've talked about, mm -hmm. so, um, so yes and no, I think the, the tree sort of influence that I always hope to have is becoming a lot stronger now. So I didn't know it would take this long. Yeah. And but it's and all perfect. So this is what, I mean, I was asking these questions because I know a lot of, there are a lot of, um, writers, potential writers, um, hopeful writers who yeah. kind of hang out around both you and me. And what I wanted to tell people was the fantasy, last time I was on your show about a week ago and I was talking about a guy who I'm sure is not watching me. At this point. He came, I was I was trying to help him with a book. Um, the and, cancer, the wife's cancer book? Yes, and he goes, he said to me, well, I've never actually read a book, not a cover to cover, and I, I've never thought of writing one, but I need a few million dollars fast. So I'm going to be writing. And Amazing. Um, it was not really, as I said, a salvageable manuscript. Yeah. But I think people jump over, they're jumping to that image of running in from a limo into a big building and doing a broadcast, <sighs> running out and going to the next place in your limo. And the reality, I think for every writer I've ever met, is that it's decades of incredible persistence oh, and yeah. I, that is what you are one of the most persistent people i have ever met no doubt so can you just because it's exciting to hear these stories uh, the stories of things that didn't go well that then turned out well yeah um, can you tell us about if you had any like dark nights of the soul <laughs> one of those oh my gosh well there's a part of the storyline where I'm in a support group of women and we're young and we're idealistic. And there's a musician who's been in a, a couple of failed bands, but did pretty well, but she's looking for her big thing. And there's an actress who's looking for her big thing and two actresses. And I'm, I'm like really devoted to this group and I love this group and I'm a new writer and breastfeeding mom and sleep deprived the whole bit. And over the course of the book, you see that I dump these girlfriends and I just need to be alone. And I go out to the woods and I, I'm like, I'll, I'll deal with them when my book is done. Like everybody leave me the F alone. Like I'm just trying to get my book done. I've got a kid and a crazy husband and like, oh my God. Yeah. And I shouldn't say crazy. Uh, energe <laughs> energetic. Energetic. Say, Sorry, energetic. Very, oh, very energetic family. Right. And um, it's a bit of a, a storm and I'm just trying to keep it together. So I don't have time for friends. Mm -hmm. And I'm in that solitude phase where I'm going to the forest, literally. Mm -hmm. And then one by one, they become world famous. I mean, world famous. Number one movie in America, number one song in America, number one cable TV show in America, Emmy Award, like the whole lot of them all become world famous. Wow. And I don't want to be a fair weather friend. I've been in LA long enough at that time where I know that as soon as somebody gets famous, everybody comes out of the woodwork and I'm not going to do that. Mm. So I don't call any of them. And mm. I go through desperate jealousy as, you know, I can't go to Walmart without seeing them on the TVs and the billboards and everywhere I go, they're on magazine covers and everything. And by the end of the book, there's a really great resolve about it, but it's just funny. It's like, you know, everybody's popping, but me. Wow. That, that must've been like, I think what people know, what I like to do on the gathering room is sort of meet people at a place where life is difficult and find a way yeah. out of that. So, yeah. you know, I so admire your ability to push on yeah. Like in that, so you're in Walmart, you're looking at pictures <laughs> of all your friends who are all world famous, you're feeling jealous, you're trying to be a good friend. That sounds really hard. Yeah. And then there's the stuff, of, then there's the work of actually writing, which is right. very, very hard in a totally different way. Right. 
So standing there in the Walmart, what mental magic do you do that allows you to take in a breath, go home and get to the hard work of writing where nobody's keeping you company and nobody. <laughs> well, okay. So funny aside was I really missed them. I missed them dearly. Mm -hmm. I just thought I was going to disappear for a while. I didn't think I was going to dump them. So I really miss them. So I, in Walmart, I went to see if one of the action figures of one of these women was available. And the lady goes, oh, they're the number one action figure doll in the world. And they're all sold out. Oh so, my God. so I thought, OK, I actually have to be my own hero mm -hmm. because I was Martha. I was tortured. I mean, I would dream about them. I would hear their music on loops in my head from morning till night. And um, I was tortured. And so I would go out into the forest every day and I would hug this circle of trees and mm -hmm. I would just beg beg mother nature to take my jealousy because I said, wow. how can I help you? I'm talking to the trees. How can I help you if I'm like a hot mess of anger? <laughs> I mean, it just, I, I knew enough that it couldn't happen. And I waited it out. It took a while. I had to hug those trees every single day and get on my knees on the mother, kiss the dirt and say, please take this from me. And it, wow. I wrote a men's letters. I wrote, I wrote letters to them because I didn't want to call. I didn't want I didn't want to expect them to to have to hear me. But I wrote letters and I said, you don't have to contact me. I just want you to know I'm happy for you. Wow. And I was happy, not really totally, but I was a little bit. So I focused on that. And then one day I woke up and I and I wasn't jealous anymore. And I was happy for them. Wow. Now, during this period of time, I'm, I'm just going to drill into this because I've, I'm curious because of my own experiences. Were you actually able to write where, when you were in that phase where you were tortured and you were banging? Oh, yes. In really? fact, it's some of my favorite stuff. And I, oh. I copy and pasted it. from. I, so I was writing a memoir, which you read, called My oh, yeah. Life Mess from years ago. And, um, and I have always used writing as a way to stay sane. So mm -hmm. if I'm going through a tough time with my ex-husband or my kid or jealousy, like in this situation, I had to write about it. So it was almost like a diary, but but better, like, you know, a beginning, middle and end. I ultimately became a magazine editor for a long time. And I, I love to tell a story of beginning, middle and end. And so I told these scenes just for my own enjoyment, not knowing I would ever use them, but for my own enjoyment. And um. And then years and years later, like two years ago, when I was working on this book, I found them. I did a control F find in my computer and just like found them right. and then copied and pasted. And I, you know, I had to make some edits, but you no, know, that raw, like painful stuff. That's the best time to write. It's not the best time to publish. Right. You yeah. know, like what I, I have in the book, I say, um, write when you're bleeding, publish uh, right when you're uh, published, when you're no longer bleeding, right when you are. Mm. So I love to write when I'm bleeding. So, oh, this is really, really interesting. Because I did a lot of that when the two memoirs I wrote in my life were of difficult periods in my life. And yes, two I of the best memoirs of all time, expecting Adam and leaving the saints. Oh, are you kidding yeah. me? Oh, my God. So thank you very much. But um, yeah, I, I, I had to write to stay sane, as you yeah. said. Yeah. And then, but but I had to wait. It was almost exactly 10 years in yeah. each case to the point where I could say I can go in there and completely, well, the way I always say it is in my journal, I show up to get attention. I get <laughs> my own attention. I get the, the attention of the divine or whatever. Yeah. Um, and it's all about me, me, me. And then when I sit down to, to edit, 10 years later is what it takes me. I don't sure. know how long it takes other people. Um, I have to say, how do I make this? show up to give attention. right it has to be universal it can't just be about staring at your navel as you said on the on it, has, it has to be it's it's so difficult because it's kind of a magic trick instead of look at me it's i see you but yeah. you're alone when you do it yeah so yeah. how do you like do you have a methodology for connecting with this is what i always do i said this to a really famous writer once i was like you can feel the energy of the people reading and you can feel it whether they're reading now, whether they read in the past or whether they're reading in the future. And I thought he'd be a totally down this. And he was like, that is not my experience. <laughs> <laughs> That's not my experience either. I'll tell you what my experience is. My <laughs> best gauge now is, do I love it? And where am I bored? Oh, if okay. I'm bored reading and I have to read it out loud. Huh. If, I'm re if I'm reading it out loud and I'm bored anywhere, that piece goes or I rewrite it. Oh, how interesting. But if it brings me joy... Mm -hmm. I have found it will bring me joy five 
years from now, 10 years from now, I mean, my first book, I go back every once in a while and look at something and it still brings me joy. Wow. So it's like Marie Kondo's system for keeping yes. your possessions. If it yes. sparks joy, you keep it. Doesn't matter what it is. That's it exactly right. Trash it no matter what it is. Yeah, Kill because it just figure if I love it, somebody else will love it too, because we're all so similar. Yeah. Oh yeah. What is most personal is most general. Yeah. So another thing, I mean, the gathering room, which is where we are now, um, is for me all about exploring spirituality. I am not religious, but I am fascinated by spirituality same. Same. and you're the same. So, you know, like the, when you end up in a book group where everyone, you know, becomes famous to the point of having action figures made of them. No, horrible. <laughs> But like, I know a lot of people who went to LA to make their fortunes or went to New York to find, to make their fortunes. And they were getting out there. They were going to the parties where they were meeting the people, yeah. kissing babies, shaking hands, the whole deal. And they never met anyone who got famous. I was yes. in like five book groups myself. And yeah. like, it's just, so when I see that happening, I call it fractaling that you've created this energy that somehow connects with a fractal of energy that is very, very, very successful. Yeah. So how, two questions. Yeah. How do you think that group came together? Really wow. like on an energetic level. Wow. And then my second question, which I will repeat if you need me to, why did it initially not work for you? Go. Whoa. <gasps> so deep. Ah, why? Okay. Okay. I think fame in my family was the ultimate pinnacle. So my mm. mother's mother died when she was nine. And my mother had a very, very lonely and sad childhood. And she spent it in movie theaters, double features. Wow. So by the time I met my mother, she was an aficionado on everything Hollywood. She knew every mm. single celebrity and all about them, names of children and whole bit. So I think there was a lot of hero worship about fame from her. Mm. And then my father was a friend to Kings. So he was very much a normal guy, stockbroker, never got wealthy. Well, he did, but he didn't sell. So by the time he died, all those millions were gone. Mm. Um, but he was friends with celebrities loved my father because he was ethical and he could talk. I remember somebody told me at his funeral that they saw Nixon bawling in my father's arms What in the forest. Okay. So my dad was a member of a men's group. A vision or did it really happen? No, no, it really happened. My dad was a member of the Bohemian club, which is very controversial. It's super Republican. Um, like all the Republican presidents were like heads of this thing. My father was not asked to be in it because he was some big wig. He was asked to be in it because he had such an excite encyclopedia knowledge of music that he became the librarian for the orchestra so so he was always with these world famous people and they worshiped him huh. so i think i just learned early on that if you really wanted to have fun you were going to be with the movers and shakers because they were doing amazing stuff so how did you find these people who weren't famous when you met them right like, how did you know? They found me. Okay, so they invited me. I was in a store with my then husband. Mm -hmm. And one of the gal who was heading up the group was in the store. And she loved my husband. They got, they were talking, talking. And she said, you need to come to our support group on Wednesday night. And I didn't want to go. I was like, uh, I'm not really a joiner. Because I'm not. I love to be alone. I'm obsessed with being alone. I'm like, ah, no. And she was like, if you don't like it, you can quit. And I was like, okay. And, and yeah, and, um, and why I was uncomfortable ultimately, as you were saying, was because they were too big for me. Mm. So they were glam and they were cutting edge and they were, they knew that spiritual technology. And I was like, I felt like a little bit of like the character Dory, the witch <laughs> um, in this children's book. I loved where Dory, like her socks were always mismatched and her and her little witchy hat was always on crooked that was me like i never felt like i fit in anywhere growing up i was always the weird occult girl who didn't think normal and so um it was hard for me to be in that group as much as i loved it and loved them so your energy went in one direction because of your socialization the way your mom and dad were yeah but then there was this big part of you that clearly yeah. didn't feel comfortable there yeah and like how do you feel now with this book with 60, 60 different 
uh, best-selling author is contributing yeah. to your book. Do you feel like you've broken through? Do you feel like that discomfort is, is have you shattered that glass ceiling yet? That's and a great if, question. Because that's what people need to know. Every, we all have the idea yeah. dream. And we've all had experiences of like seeing other people do better than we have. And like, what is yeah. wrong? With me? Yeah. And yours is just very, very dramatic. Right. So you seem to have punched through this glass ceiling that you placed on yourself. But I want to know how you did it. it. You know what? It was every single day working on my craft. Because eventually I got to the point where I was so confident in the beauty of my stories that that I thought, okay, if I am too insecure to publish these, I have to get over myself because these stories are alive mm -hmm. and they want to be out there. And I've been dragging around, dragging them around on my ankles, like body bags. Like they, wow. you guys know anybody out there who's been writing a story for a long time, you know, you carry it with you everywhere. That sucker does not go away. Yep. And, um, and so I trust in that. And I keep saying to myself, Linda, to show up, are you insecure? Yes. Do you feel like scared out of your mind some days? A hundred percent. Do you feel like you've had enough sleep and you're prepared enough? No. Have I even called the publicist at my publisher to follow up on 72 things I was supposed to? No. So this is not comfortable for me at all, mm -hmm. but I, I'm, I'm forcing myself to show up because I believe in the vision. Wow. That just remember that everyone show up because you believe in your vision. Okay. We have a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, so We've got one, uh, Ro, are you creating, uh, curating these on the screen? So Marcia says, what are the quirkiest writing habits that you collected for the book? Oh, that's interesting. Quirkiest writing habits. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Quirkiest. Mm. I mean, everybody has like a different way about them. So you and Cheryl Strayed both read literature that blows your mind before you write. Like you inspire yourselves with like great literature. Um, other people just wake up in the middle of the night and go for it. You know, they, they're like stealing time like me, like, oh my God, I've got an hour. <laughs> Let's go. I never read anything. Hardly ever. I do, I do every once in a while I did. Um, some people, oh gosh, quirky. I have a, I have a story about one gal. She couldn't get her writing done. And she said to her husband, okay, I'm taking half of a Saturday every single week from now on. And I'm going to a coffee shop and you're keeping the kids. And like she comes home and the house is a bomb and there's like, there's, there's crumbs in the kids' shoes and there's socks in the toaster. And, and like the kids are now, you know, college football, brilliant, but, but it works. So, you know, we're all just meddling through. I don't know that there's anything quirky that I can remember, but I'll tell you, there's a million different examples of how we're all wrangling time and it's not easy. Yeah, wrangling time. That's a great phrase for it. Okay, so Dr. Donna says, do you write with an audience in mind or do you just write? So Liz Gilbert always has one person. She's I like, know, I try. I have six. Always. You have six? Yeah, yeah random. No. Choose different for each book. Yeah, I got nobody. I, I think about that all the time. I'm like, well, Liz has one person. Who's my one person? And then initially it was when I was working on the memoir, it was a DT Karana. I, call, I called mm -hmm. a DT yeah. who was on our pub celebration show that you were on. And I called the DT. I said, I'm going to write this to you. And she was like, Oh, thank you. And then I forgot. And I just, I just write the stories that I love. So, okay. So again, there are as many different ways to do this as there are individuals. Okay. Tony says, I can relate to writing when at our lowest, as Linda spoke on. My question for her is about focus and setup. Question, what is your cocoon, Linda? When in pain and down, doubt, she writes. Where in the physical world is her fluidity world? Mm. So yeah, where do you go into a cocoon? Where you first can thing in the morning, first thing. I've gotten really good and selfish about it. So I wake up and I call it my bed office. I make sure I've got water and an apple by the bed. Um, I wake up early so the dogs don't want to go out yet, which is heaven. So like four, four or five a.m. For many years, I wrote at three a.m. It was nuts. Um, and I, I was very careful to safeguard my energy so that I could do it. So it, it's all in the storyline, but I was very extreme about safeguarding my energy and it worked for a really long time. Don't ask me how, because if I tried to wake up at 3am now, I would die. Um, 
but I don't eat as well as I used to. You know, I don't, I don't have the same good habits that I used to. I've gotten lazier over time. I have food habits, but if I had to get up at three in the morning, you would just have to take me out back and hit me with a shovel and raise a good pig instead. <laughs> so, yeah, at 3 a.m., you deserve all the success yeah. in the world. Okay, Adrian says, my question for both, what time do you ride and how long per session? That's exactly first thing yeah. in the morning. Yeah. It's best for me if I can do it first thing in the morning as well. But I have been known to just like lately, I am I'm so obsessed with this book proposal I'm writing. I write on my phone yes. while the physical therapist has yes. acupuncture needles in my feet. Yeah. I write on my phone while I'm getting my hair cut. I get yeah. so it's it's become constant and I just yeah. got touching the book. Because touch it every day. That's what Danny Shapiro says. Yeah, if I just touch it, it stays in my mind. Yeah. Where if I don't touch it for several days it falls apart. So I, I touch it now. So yeah. that, that sounds really weird. I touch. No, my, so. no, I love it. I do the same <laughs> thing. I, what I love to do is I'll, do you use Scrivener? Have you ever used Scrivener latte and literature? Me is like trying to open a padlock with my it's, nose. It's, <laughs> it's very, very hard. I actually hired somebody online to help me decipher it and figure it out. Um, but I, I do love it. So I'll put my chapters in Scrivener and then I also have it on my phone. So if I'm at a doctor's office or somewhere, which I, I love this so much, I'll pull up a chapter and I read. And when I have to edit it, rather than edit it on the phone, I don't want to do that. I take a screenshot. I uh -huh. email it to myself with the edit. And then I come home and I just make all the, I just email, email, just knock them out. And I make all the edits. That's, you know what I do? I, I'm driving along and I'm like, hey, Siri. <laughs> write about like um write about that jellyfish that ages in reverse so it never dies and then siri says something like ride along with the horsey pony. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, no that's not it but i have a little something to remind yes. myself yes it, it, it's funny we were we we came to write a book uh, to talk about a book on writing and we yeah. are right, talking about writing but we're also mainly talking about time which yes. is a really interesting thing that time is the limiting factor. And we live in this world that we're so starved for time yeah. to find something soulful that you've pictured in the world. You really have to be incredibly persistent and incredible, not just persistent in hanging on, but in going back, going back, going back, Constant. carving out space for it, carving out time. Yeah. It's really fascinating. So Dore says, I enjoy writing and need it as a personal therapy process. I feel as if I have something unique to share, but it feels icky to consider that other people would find my writing and thoughts worth the effort to read. Did you find yourself with similar feelings? How did you process that? No, I'm grandiose. I always thought I had something to share. Like, no icky. Um, hmm. What I did have, what slightly similar, is I had the voices of mean girls, high school mean girls hmm, in yes. my head. And I have a chapter about those mean girls and I'm actually going to see them in a couple of weeks at my high school reunion. So That's that should be fun. That should be fun. I didn't name them, but they, will know, they will know who they are. <laughs> right. um, but, but I definitely had to deal with the, the kids in school who thought I was stupid mm -hmm. and made sure that I knew about it because I was in the bottom third of my high school graduating class. I was late every single day to English. It was the first period I, I was, you know, raised in right. the, San, the San Francisco Bay area. So wow. my hair was, uh, my hair was always frizzy. I would cry sometimes on the way to school because I could feel it. I could feel it frizzy. Oh, wow. And God forbid I get to class on time. I mean, no way. So people would laugh. I would parade in like, you know, get my confident walk going into, into English class. And people still to this day tease me about it. So nobody expected me to be book smart. Wow. It's amazing how different our backgrounds can be and all headed for the same way of life. Okay. So Gail says, this is for Linda. Did you ever, do you ever find your spiritual life and literary life are at odds with each other? Do you behave mm. differently in different communities or social situations? And if so, how do you make your peace with it? That's so interesting. You know, I've always seen my writing as a spiritual practice. I, I studied with Guru Singh, who is a, a great character in the book who predicted my career early on and gave me a lot of confidence. And he, get, he kept giving me these prescriptions for meditations and I could do meditation. I got kind of good at it every once in a while. And then I would always like ditch it because I wanted to write. Mm -hmm. And ultimately he said to me, your writing is your meditation. So to me, writing always was a spiritual practice. 
Um, the fight that I've constantly had in my life is I am so in love with that process and so sort of self-contained that the people in my life are kind of like, hey, uh, can we have a little more attention? So, uh, so I've really had to learn how to be very, very present with my people when I'm with them. Uh -huh. And um, that has been the biggest challenge of my life is just, you know, when I'm with somebody not to be trying to rewrite the chapter in my head mm. or get back to it as soon as possible. Yeah. Isaac Asimov said, every moment of my life has either been spent writing or wanting <laughs> to write. You know, it's an addiction. It's a, it's a, it's a sickness, I think. It is. We talked about this on, on your podcast the other day. It's definitely yeah. logical, but hey, I don't suffer from insanity. I enjoy it. Exactly. So, uh, for, for all y'all out there who think that you could never make a dream come true, just, I mean, here's someone who's made a dream come true in so many ways and featuring a whole bunch of other really amazing writers who've made their dreams come true. It's all compiled in one book. So if you want to write or if you just want to live a dream, yeah, check it out. And Martha, your pieces are beyond. I right. mean, you're, you're, the, the stuff that you share in the book, both from the podcast and that you gave me after the fact, written stuff, ah. it's some of the most magical stuff in the book. It's, well, there's a I lot love. of magic in this book. And I think there's a lot of magic flowing through you. And I cannot wait to go to Walmart and get your action figure. <sighs> <laughs> that's not happening dude that, that is, is the plus that you know we're, i'm friends again with this whole group we're all friends oh yeah oh my god we laughed yeah i had them read it just to make sure that they were cool with it and um uh, we laugh about those days jeez fantastic so everybody your dreams can come true um throw out an ideal day scenario and then persist and go back and bash away and touch it every day that sounded weird um <laughs> but seriously Stay on the frequency of your dreams. It really can happen. And Linda Sievertson and her book are here to prove it. Do you see how I dress to match it? Oh, my God. Right. I love. Lots of love to you, Linda, and to all the wonderful people out in the gallery. Love you. Love Thanks, you. guys. Bye. Bye.